In the 1955 NFL draft, I realize that was a while back, in the ninth round, the Pittsburgh Steelers selected a quarterback by the name of Johnny. The Steelers cut Johnny before he ever threw a single pass, and they sent him home with $10 in bus fare money. Now, Johnny, people said, was too skinny, too small, and did not have the arm strength to play in the NFL. But that did not stop Johnny. He wouldn't quit. He played semi-pro ball for $6 a game as he waited for an opportunity to try to make a tryout with another team. And in 1956, he attended a tryout for the Baltimore Colts, and the head coach, Webb Eubank, brought in Johnny to be the backup to starting quarterback um, George Shaw. In week two... Johnny made his debut in mop-up duty. His very first pass, an interception that was run back for a touchdown. His next two possessions, he fumbled the ball. His career was off to a great start. Many people would say he should not be playing at all, but two weeks later, George Shaw broke his leg, and Johnny became the starting quarterback and it did not take long for him to catch on. In fact, by the time the season was done, he had set the NFL rookie record for pass completion percentage. The next year, in 1957, Johnny led the NFL in passing yards, touchdown passes, yards passing attempt, and passer rating. In 1958, Johnny Unitas led the Baltimore Colts to the NFL championship game and with two minutes left in the game, down 17 to 14, he completed seven consecutive passes to set up a game-tying field goal, forcing the first overtime contest in NFL history. In overtime, he led the Colts on an 80-yard march, culminating in a one-yard touchdown that resulted in them winning. The very next year, Unitas led them to another NFL championship. Realize it wasn't the Super Bowl yet. That came later. And then in 1970, he led them to a championship to the Super Bowl victory. When Unitas finished his career 18 years after he started, he had set many records. He was number one in NFL history in passing attempts, completions, and yards. He is the first person to eclipse 40,000 yards of passing. He set a record of 290 passing touchdowns, beating out second place Fran Tarkington by 40 touchdowns. He set a record of 47 consecutive games with at least one touchdown pass, which stood more than 50 years until it was broken by Drew Brees. He won three NFL championships, three MVP awards, five first team all pro selections, three second team all pro selections, 10 Pro Bowls. He led the league four times in passing, four times in passing touchdowns, and two times in passer rating. Johnny could have looked at his physical inadequacies and all the comments that everyone said about him and said, you know what? I don't have what it takes. That's it. I quit. I'm finished. But Johnny did not listen to to those inadequacies. He didn't look at himself and say he can't. Instead, he went on to greatness. I want to welcome everyone this morning here to Radius. It's great to have you. Um, everyone who here in person and those who are watching us online, thanks for being with us today. And we're continuing our series called When Prophets Want to Die, where we're looking at great men and women of God, people who love God, who fear God, but at some point, either a moment or a season, they experience so much disappointment, so much discouragement or disillusionment with God that they say, Lord, I've had it. I've had enough. Just take me home. I am finished. And this morning, we're going to look at Moses, a man who dealt with inadequacy. In your notes this morning, feelings of inadequacy kill your capacity. If you have the Radius app, you can find our sermon notes there. Or if you have your worship program on the back, we have 
our sermon notes. But if you and I carry around feelings of inadequacy, it will kill our capacity to be greatly used of God. If Unitas had given in the inadequacy, not only would he be never played football, he never would have been an all-pro, championship-winning, Hall of Fame quarterback who sell multiple records. And friends, last week we talked about, as we looked at Samson, God has dreams. He has visions for you and me. Our old men dream dreams. The young men see visions. God has things he wants us to accomplish. But if we give in to inadequacy, I'm not enough. I can't do it. We will not accomplish those great dreams and visions that God has for us. And so this morning, we want to talk about how do we overcome inadequacy. I want you to look at Numbers chapter 11, and we're going to see where Moses ties into our series, When Prophets Want to Die. What was the situation that was, took place where he says, I don't measure up, God, take me out. The setting is that Israel has just left Mount Sinai. In chapter 10 of Numbers, they leave Mount Sinai. Mount Sinai is where God gave the Ten Commandments. By the way, did you know that Moses is the most sinful person of all time? He broke all Ten Commandments at once. Had to wake some of you up there. You've already been partying too much this Memorial Day week and doing too many house chores. Yes, all right, let's go back. It's where he got the Ten Commandments, the, the, the tabernacle, the beginning of the year when we did the series on pursuing his presence. We saw all the different things in the tabernacle, all of the law. For about a year, a little over 11 months, Israel is camped at Mount Sinai. God's downloading everything for worship, for how to run as a nation, the moral code, the legislative code for the community. And Moses is there. They leave and it says they go three days, and Israel complains. All right? And we're going to pick it up in verse 11, or excuse me, verse 4 of Numbers 11. It says, Now the mixed multitude who were among them yielded to intense craving. So the children of Israel also wept again and said, Who will give us meat to eat? We remember the fish which we ate freely in Egypt the cucumbers, the melons, the leeks, the onions, and the garlic. But now our whole being is dried up. There is nothing at all except this manna before our eyes. There are at probably at least 1.5 million people in the nation of Israel, and they want meat. That's equivalent to the population of Phoenix, Arizona, Philadelphia, or Dallas. Can you imagine having to come up with meat for populations of those cities? That's the amount of people we're talking about. And here's the thing. They're out in the desert. There's no Denny's in the desert. There's no Walmart in the wilderness. Where is Moses going to get meat for all of these people? Even if he had the money, where do you get the meat for that? In verse 10, it says, Moses heard the people of every family wailing at the entrance of their tents, the Lord became exceedingly angry, and Moses was troubled. He asked the Lord, Why have you brought this trouble on your servant? What have I done to displease you that you put the burden of all these people on me? Did I conceive all these people? Did I give them birth? Why do you tell me to carry them in my arms as a nurse carries an infant to the land you promised on oath to their ancestors? Where can I get meat for all these people? They keep wailing to me. Give us meat to eat. Look at verse 14. Pay attention to this. I cannot carry all these people by myself. The burden is too heavy for me. If this is how you're going to treat me, Please go ahead and kill me. If I found favor in your eyes, and do not let, my, let me face my own ruin. Moses feels so inadequate to meet this need. He's overwhelmed by it, and he wants to die. He doesn't want to see that he has failed. 
He has no idea how he's going to provide for meat for all of these people. And he doesn't want to feel like a failure. And so he says, God, I want you to kill me. I want you to just take me out. Do you like to fail? Does anyone in the house like to fail? I don't know of a single person who likes to fail. We like to win. We like to be successful. And for Moses, he's looking at this task and he says, it's too great. Don't let me see that I have failed. The thing is, is that God didn't really need Moses. In your notes, God didn't need Moses' help for anything. He just wanted Moses' help. He just wanted Moses' help. God doesn't need our help either. Do you realize that God doesn't really need you and me? He just wants to include us in his purposes, in his plans. God could do anything on the planet with or without us. He could use the armies of heaven to accomplish it. He could use anyone at any time. He doesn't need anyone or anything. We really are not necessary to the eternal story. He could perform his wonders without the involvement of any of us. But occasionally, he decides to lift you and me up from our insignificance. And he says, hey, I want you to be the rescuer. I want you to be the hand of provision. I want you to be the one who has the message of hope, of help, of healing. What a privilege you and I have been given. And Moses loses sight of who he is and of who God is. Because you see, when God begins to use us, And we see people coming to Christ, people being healed, a need met, someone being delivered and set free from a life-controlling problem, and you and I have been the instrument. You know what happens? That can be some pretty heady stuff. And we begin to think, wow, look what I have done. Look at what I have accomplished, what I have built And it never really was us in the first place. It was God. This is not the first time that Moses felt inadequate. Look at Exodus chapter 3. Exodus chapter 3, verse 10. And when God first called Moses to lead Israel out of slavery, he's at the burning bush and he says to Moses, I hear the cries of my people, and I've seen their oppression. I want to deliver Israel. I want to set them free from slavery. And Moses, you're the one I want to do it. And in verse 10, this is what Moses, uh, what the Lord says. He says, come now, therefore, I'll send you to Pharaoh that you may bring my people, the children of Israel, out of Egypt. Verse 11, but Moses said to God, who am I that I should go to Pharaoh And then I should bring the children of Israel out of Egypt. So he said, God said, I will certainly be with you. And this shall be a sign to you that I have sent you. Now look at this. What is the sign? When you have brought the people out of Egypt, you shall serve God on this mountain. Now here's the funny thing. If God's calling Moses to go to Pharaoh and realize going back to Egypt, Moses killed a man 40 years earlier. He was on Pharaoh's most wanted list. Now the old Pharaoh's died and new ones come up. But God says, go back. And Moses says, I can't do it. And God says, I'm going to give you a sign. I would think this sign would be something for now. In fact, when you look in chapter 4, because Moses keeps saying, I can't do it, I can't do it, I can't do it. God says, I'm going to give you a sign. Take your rod, throw it down in the ground. It's going to become a viper. It's going to become a snake. Take your hand, put it inside your coat, and when you pull it out, it's going to become leprous. It's going to have this disease, a flesh-eating disease, your hand, and then put it back in your coat and take it out, and your hand's going to be whole. Those were signs that came later. But this sign here 
God says, when you've brought Israel out, you're going to worship me on this mountain. Now, what mountain is it? Look at verse 1 of Exodus chapter 3. Moses was tending the flock of Jethro, his father-in-law, the priest of Midian. He led the flock to the back of the desert and came to Horeb, the mountain of God. I want you to write these chapters down in your Bible, okay? Exodus 31, 18 and Exodus 34, 2. Psalm 106, verse 19 and Exodus 33, verse 6. When you read all those references, you will realize that Mount Horeb and Mount Sinai are the same mountain. What a has happened is that Moses is taking care of the sheep on Mount Horeb, Mount Sinai, and God says, I'm going to bring you and Israel back here. This mountain, this mountain where God gave him the Ten Commandments, gave him the design of the tabernacle, all of the law, where they spent a year. Friends, God was looking into the future when Moses in Numbers 11, is going to feel like a failure, the need's too great, and he's going to say, God, I want to die. God knows Moses is going to feel that way. And he says, Moses, here's a sign that you will know that I'm with you, that I'm bringing you out, I'm using you. You're going to worship me on this mountain. Moses experienced that promise for a year, and he forgot it in three days' time. Wow. That's the destructive power of inadequacy. The feelings of inadequacy, they destroy, they kill your capacity to do great things for God. Moses felt inadequate. I mean, Moses forgets about the rod turning to a snake and his hand becoming leprous and clean. He forgets about the ten plagues about the Nile turning to blood. He forgets about the frogs, the gnats, the flies, the dead cattle, the boils all over people's body, the hail, the locusts, the darkness, and the plague of the firstborn, killing the firstborn sons of Israel. He forgets that when Israel says, when Pharaoh says, you can go, Israel asks their Egyptian neighbors, hey, I want your Porsche, I want your camper, I want your silverware, I want your bank account. Whatever they asked for, they received it. How God made them, take them from rags to riches, from slaves to being, having whatever they wanted. Moses forgot about how Israel went into the wilderness and Pharaoh follows them. They come to the Red Sea, they're trapped, but God opens the Red Sea. They pass through. Pharaoh comes through with the armies and they die, they perish. Moses forgets about God turning poisonous water into good water. How when God gave them meat again the first time, and now they're asking for it again, he forgets about another situation with water. Moses forgets about all of the miracles God had accomplished through him. And he says, I can't do it. Friends, there are some of us here today We've said that very thing to God. I can't do it. I'm not talented enough. I'm not able. I, I, I don't have the looks. I don't have the connections. I don't have the education. I can't do it. And the enemy is killing the dream, the vision, the destiny that God has for you. God wants to do great things in our city, great things through you and me. He wants us to partner with Him but that spirit of inadequacy, of insecurity, that I don't measure up, I'm not enough, is keeping some of us from living the dreams that God has for us. In your notes this morning, take a look. It says, Moses falls into the trap that we can fall into. There's so much need for me to meet that we think we are the source. We think, hey, if it's going to happen, it's because of me, because of my intelligence, because of my maneuvering, because of my networking, because of my conversations, because of my talent, because of my skills. But it's not. We are not the source. The truth is there's so much need that only God can meet the need. Moses thinks he's more important 
than he really is. He forgets who he is. How many of you are planting gardens? Maybe you're doing that this Memorial Day weekend. Some of you are, you're gardeners. Now, for your garden to survive, what does it need? Water. Yep, it needs water. How are you going to get water to your garden? A hose, yeah. Now, if you just take a hose and you put it in the garden, is it going to work? No. It has to be hooked up to the spigot. And so many times, what we, we realize the hose is not the source, right? The hose is just the conduit for the water to come out of the source. And yet so many times, we think we are the source. The hose isn't the source. The spigot is the source. And friends, for you and I to dream the dreams, to live the dreams that God has for us, to do great things for God, we need to remember He is the source. We're just the conduit. We're all hosers, all right? That good old Canadian, hey, you hoser, you know. We're just the hose. We're just the conduit that brings the life-giving water to those who are dying and thirsty. But it's so easy as God's using us that we begin to think it is me and not he. That's why it's important for us. What's our theme for 2024? Pursue His presence. That's why we need to pursue His presence more than we pursue the dream. Because if you only pursue the dream and you lose sight of the presence, you think you're the source when He's the source. Pursue the source. Be connected to Jesus. Live in relationship with Christ because that is where we get the adequacy to be used of God and to do what He wants. In your notes this morning, it says, we need a low estimate of our importance and a high estimate of our worth. We need a low estimate of how important, how needed am I. God can do anything with or without me. I remember when I was in Bible college, I had a professor and he brought a bucket of water to class one day. And he says, you want to know how important you are, how indispensable you are? He says, get a bucket of water like this one here, take your fist, put it in the bucket of water, pull it out and see how big of a hole is left behind. He says, that's how much God really needs you. He doesn't need you at all. He just wants you to include you. It's a privilege that he's partnering with us. And so many times we have, we do, this is the thing, Satan wants us to flip it, where we think we are so important and yet we have so little worth and we walk around with, with inadequacy and insecurity. Have a low estimate of your importance and a high estimate of your worth to God. You are God's son. You are God's daughter. You're made in his image. You're more than a conqueror. Through Christ we can do all things, but it is he, not me, who accomplishes them. God has dreams and visions for us, but in your notes, look at this. Sometimes God brings you to the end of yourself so that you can see who's really carrying the load. And that's what happens with Moses. In Numbers 11, verse 21, Moses said, Here I am among 600,000 men on foot. That refers to soldiers, the foot soldiers. So there are 600,000 soldiers in Israel, men of fighting age. If each of those guys is married, that's 1.2 million people. And if those couples have just one child, you're looking at 1.8 million people. That's where theologians say there's probably at least one and a half million people in Israel, if not more. And it could have been three or four if they had large families and you had singles and that kind of thing. So you're talking about millions of people. And Moses says, you say, I will give them meat for a whole month? Would they have, en have enough if flocks and herds were slaughtered for them? Would they have enough if all the fish in the sea were caught for them? The Lord answered Moses, Is the Lord's arm too short? Now you will see whether or not what I say 
will come true for you. Friends, in your notes, God's arm really isn't too short. It never is. But sometimes he has to put things out of our reach so we can realize it. In your notes, the solution to inadequacy isn't to start believing that you're adequate. It's to get comfortable with the fact that you're not and to remember that you're walking alongside one who is fully sufficient for every situation he leads you into. You and I will never be enough on our own. We will always be inadequate, but we have one who's walking with us, providing us, giving us the wisdom, the strength, the ideas, the miracles, the power, whatever it is, it is God. God is adequate. God is adequate. And he'd been proving that to Moses from the time of the burning bush all the way up to this point, through the ten plagues, through the Red Sea, through the water, through the, the not having meat, God had been showing Moses, I am adequate. God is sufficient even when you're not. God is sufficient even when you think you are. And sometimes he has to bring us to a place where we realize it's not me. It's him. And that's what he did to Moses here. Only when we arrive at the precipice of our own failure can we really see the source of our possible success. Because here's the thing, when you and I start leaning into the dream, the vision that God gives us, we embrace the calling he's called us to, you may have success or you may not. A couple of weeks from now when we talk about prophets who want to die, we're going to look at a guy named Jeremiah. And Jeremiah, he went 50 years. Nobody listened to his message. No one repented. No one got saved. Jeremiah doesn't see any results. He didn't see the miracles like Moses saw. He doesn't see a revival. He sees rebellion. And God may give us success or he may not give us success. And it's so easy when we feel like we have not achieved results, then we're a failure. No, a failure is one who disobeys God. You want to know a definition of success? Doing what God told you to do. Jeremiah was a success because he obeyed God regardless of what other people's response was to his message, to his ministry. And that's what a success is, realizing that God is a source. I'm just doing what he tells me to do. Sometimes we think, man, if I'm used of God, great things are going to happen. And there, there are some results of being used for God in your notes. Number one, it does create special moments that are exhilarating. If you've ever been used of God and you pray for someone and they're healed or you're able to lead someone to Christ or, or something miraculous takes place, how many, it's like you've experienced that exhilarating feeling. It's like, wow, look what happened. Isn't it an awesome feeling to be used of God? And that's the result that we most often want. But there's other results. Number two, loneliness. Many times people who are greatly used of God face loneliness in their lives. Moses did. Even though he had Joshua, even though there was Caleb, and, you know, who, Joshua and Caleb went in the promised land, but Moses felt alone for much of his life. Number three, rejection. Many times we face rejection when we're doing what God tells us to do and we're rejected even from those that God is using us to save. I mean, how many times did Israel say, we want another leader. We want to go back to Egypt. We want to appoint someone else. Forget you, Moses. In fact, there was times they wanted to kill Moses. We're going to get rid of you and get someone else. Sometimes we're rejected when we say, yes, God, I'll do what you want me to do. And number four, it may require deep self-sacrifice and loss. Sometimes it causes loss in your life. 
We're going to wrap up our series in a couple of weeks and we're going to look at someone who embraced the vision God had, but the vision required death. He lost it all. You see, doing God's work, it has a way of showing us how quickly our resources run out. If it's all about us, we don't measure up. But God, with God, all things are possible. We had a word this morning about the bigness of God, the greatness of God, how God can do anything. And I believe this morning God wants to set people free from feelings of inadequacy, insecurity, because He has a dream. He has a vision. He just wants us to say, God, whatever you want me to do in my neighborhood, at my work, in my school, in the church, in the community, in the state, in the government, whatever you want me to do, God, I will do it, regardless of of the results, whether I see success or not. Moses wanted to feel like a success. God, don't let me see my ruin. Kill me now. I can't give him meat for a month. But his focus was on himself instead of on the king. And this morning, what does God, what does the king want to do through you and me? And what are the lies of the enemy that you're buying into that say, I'm not enough, I can't accomplish it, God can't use me. I can't speak, I can't share, I can't minister. Don't let the devil steal the dream, the plans, the vision God has for you. Because there will be moments of exhilaration. There will be moments of loneliness of rejection, of deep loss. But friends, someday when we're up in heaven, God is going to say, well done, thou good and faithful servant. Enter in the joy of your Lord. And then what does it say? You've been faithful in a little. I'm going to give you more. Do you realize that the setting of that is not on the earth now? The setting of that is after Jesus comes back and rules and reigns on the earth, what we do here is just a proving and a testing ground for what we're going to be doing after the rapture, during the millennium. It's not over here. And so don't look at what happens here. You've got to look at eternity. There's a long time coming. And God says, I want you. I want to include you in my work, my plans and purposes. In your notes, I want to wrap up with this last blank to fill in. It says the solution to inadequacy is not to think more of yourself. It is to think more of God. What's interesting is after Moses went through Numbers 11, where he said, God, kill me, I'm not enough. Verse 3 of Numbers 12, Now the man Moses was very humble, more than all the men who were on the face of the earth. Friends, when we realize God is our source, it produces humility in us. When we think, I'm the source, it produces pride. And God used that instant in Moses' life to realize, you're the source, God. I humble myself. I'm here to do what you want me to do. And here's the tough thing. That's in Numbers chapter 12. In Numbers chapter 13, they send the 12 spies out to the promised land. And they say, we're not going in. Moses thought, I'm almost done. I'm going to get him to Israel. He had 40 more years of the wilderness. God had to humble him because one of his greatest tests of leadership is how do you lead people when they're not going to arrive at their destination? We're told in James chapter 4, verse 6 and 10, God resists the proud, but he gives grace to the humble. Humble yourselves in the sight of the Lord and he will lift you up. Let's pray this morning. Father God, you don't need our help, 
but you want our help. Help us to see you as our source and to walk close to you, to be connected to you as the hose to the spigot. God, help us to receive everything we need to pursue your presence, to pursue your glory, not our glory, to pursue your purposes, not our purposes. Father, I pray that you will destroy feelings of inadequacy in every person this morning to use us for your glory and your honor. Earlier I mentioned God has a dream, He has a vision, He wants to use us, He wants to include us, but there's some of you, you struggle with inadequacy. Psalms talks about how we are fearfully and wonderfully made. You were skillfully woven as an exquisite tapestry in your mother's womb. You are the workmanship of God. God wants to use each and every one of us, but some of us feel like, I didn't come from the right family. I don't have the right education. I don't have the right connections. I don't have the the right abilities. God, you didn't bless me with talents like so-and-so. And you have... Just kind of set aside in your own mind that I really can't do anything great for God. If you struggle with that this morning, I'd like you to raise your hand. How many here, you struggle with inadequacy in your life, insecurity? Thank you. Anyone else? Thank you. Thank you. Hands going up, different places. Some of you this morning, maybe you've felt like a failure. You've tried something for God and it didn't work out. And you feel like, I'm not going to do that again. Maybe people look at you and they say, you can't do anything. You've listened to the voice of others or you've listened to the voice of failure. And you says, I'm not going to try anymore. And you need to put aside that rejection, put aside that shame and say, God, I am going to obey you. I'll do whatever you want me to do, no matter what happens. If that's you this morning, I'd like you to raise your hand. Just put your hand up high. If you've struggled with shame, with rejection, feeling like a failure with the voices of others, thank you. I see those hands. Thank you. There's some of you here today, you haven't humbled yourself. Because there's some of you who say, you know what? I'm a good person. I'm not that bad. The Bible says all of us have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. God loves you and me so much that He gave Jesus His Son to die on the cross for us. We're sinners. We deserve to die and go to hell. But God loved us so much that He sent Jesus who lived a sinless, pure life. And Jesus died for our sin. So all of us need to humble ourselves and realize that God, I need forgiveness. I need to surrender my life to You. And if you're here this morning and you haven't humbled yourself, you haven't asked God to become the leader of your life, you haven't surrendered your life and asked for for forgiveness of your sin, you need to do that in this moment, whether you're in the house or watching online. How many would say, I need God's forgiveness. I need to humble myself. I need to confess I'm a sinner. I need Him to take control of my life. Just put your hand up and you can put it back down. Anyone this morning, God speaking to your heart. Thank you. I see that hand. Anyone else this morning? Thank you. Thank you. Anyone else today? Those watching online, if God's speaking to you, I want you to lift your hand up and say, God, I want you to forgive me. I want to follow you. I want to embrace your plan for my life. You're my leader. You're in charge. Just go ahead and put your hand up. Anyone else in the house, God's speaking to you. He's drawing you. You know you need cleansing from your sin. You're guilty. and You need to get right with God in this moment. Just put your hand up right now, and then you can put it back down. I'm going to say a prayer. And I'm gonna, I would like everyone to repeat this prayer. I don't want anyone praying alone. Lord Jesus, I am a sinner. You died for my sin. Please forgive me. I humble myself. I commit my life to you. You're my king, my leader, my savior. Thank you for saving me from my sin. I will live for you, for your glory, for your honor, and your purposes. Amen.